session. Um, I'm Jeremy Yoder from the University of British Columbia, and I'm going to talk to you today about um, a parallelized scan for local adaptation in uh, lodgepole pine. So, local adaptation is a subject that has already come up a couple times this session, um, many times in many talks already uh, at the conference. Um, essentially, populations of a, different populations of a species encounter different environments and adapt to those different environments, accumulate genetic differences. Um, this is local adaptation. Uh, this is a concept that really dates all the way back to the origins of evolutionary ecology. Um, Charles Darwin famously did not have a very firm idea about what actually causes speciation, but he thought that one of the things that contributes to it is adaptation to uh, the direct influence of different physical conditions. Um, and so today we, we now understand local adaptation as a first step to ecological speciation and really the means by which ecological processes are translated into evolutionary patterns. Um, it also, in the genomics era, provides a really handy observational basis for finding the genes that underlie adaptation to those varying environments. So we can go out into the, the natural populations that are experiencing different environments and uh, genotype loci and look for loci that uh, show allele frequency associations to those different environments. Um, and if we do that at lots and lots of loci across the whole genome, we infer that uh, loci where those associations are strongest uh, are in regions of the genome that are important for traits that are locally adapted to the, the environmental variation we're looking at. Um, collecting this kind of data is easier than, than ever at this point in time, but it's still not free, and we, we have other expenses associated with sampling natural populations. Um, travel time, um, sample collection and management. Uh, so we still have a question about what we sequence, and is it better to sample more environments or to sample more individuals per environment? Um, so we have an opportunity to, oh, sorry, uh, the, the, the trade-off really is can we, do we want to try to sample in order to cover all possible contrasts? We have populations scattered across this variable landscape. Do we take samples from all of those and try to make comparisons among all of those different um, different possible environmental and genetic distances? Or do we want to go, uh, do we want to take some time to identify uh, replicate contrasts within the, within the landscape and um, control for population structure and environmental difference by just only looking at similar distances? Uh, this is an idea that, that actually comes up in, in lots of early uh, landscape genomics, but um, it's formalized really nicely in a in a simulation study by Katie Lauderhouse and Mike Whitlock, um, who uh, actually tested it against a couple of different sampling strategies and um, adaptation on a, a continuously varied landscape. Um, and we have an opportunity to, to try this kind of thing out with real data in the AdaptTree data set. Um, AdaptTree is a project that has been uh, identifying climate associated genes in uh, lodgepole pine, Pinus contorta, and uh, the the uh, interior spruce species complex. Um, a first round of the project used sequence capture data uh, to identify millions of SNPs in both species and zero in on 47 genes that are associated with climate um, in a genotype environment association analysis or cold hardiness in a genotype phenotype association um, in both species. So 47 genes shared between the two that, that are involved in, in the same adaptation. Um, that's reported in, in a science paper that was out last year. Um, I am going to be working with uh, the lodgepole pine data uh, right now. If you want to see what is new with the spruce, uh, look for John Degner's talk um, tomorrow, uh, tomorrow morning. Um, you'll also, if you go to that talk, you may uh, find that the, the map aesthetic looks similar. I want to make it clear I stole it from John. <laughs> um, so the, the, the data set that, that comes after the um, after the sequence capture data set is a high throughput genotyping array. Uh, this was designed with candidates from that, that science study uh, and markers that we inferred to, to be neutral, so we had a, an index for uh, natural population structure. Um, we get about 30,000 SNPs genotyped consistently from, from the array, um, and it's been, um, it's been run on samples from 3,500 trees across uh, almost 300 sampling sites. 
Um, this is not, of course, the full range of, of lodgepole pine, but British Columbia and Alberta cover a, a, a wide array of environments and rugged terrain, and so we get lots and lots of climate variation, and we have very, uh, very fine-grained sampling of uh, population variation across that landscape. So this is really a maximized uh, sampling of genetic and climate variation for this region. Uh, what could we get if we had a smaller, more focused data set? And particularly if we step back and identify uh, contrasts that we think are important in the landscape and made the comparison across replicate versions of those. Uh, so the Adaptree team identified population pairs uh, that are separated by similar distances in mean annual temperature. Um, these are populations that have already been sampled. And you can see that the, the geographic distance between them varies somewhat. Um, but they're, they're, uh, and the minimum and maximum temperatures that they're at are, are different, but they're, um, they're varying across a consistent environmental distance between each member of the pair. Um, there were also transects of multiple sites identified, and these are um, anywhere from one to, uh, from about six to eight sites along a transect, um, covering a wider total range of, of climate, but distance between sites on the transects is smaller. Um, so these are two different possible ways to, to get at this replicate, replicate uh, look across environmental distances. Um, and mean annual temperature in this landscape is, is correlated with a bunch of other stuff, uh, which all sort of aligns with elevation. Um, so these are other climate variables for the same site sets that I just showed you and the population pairs. Um, this is precipitation of snow, uh, goes up at high elevation, surprise. Um, the climate moisture deficit, uh, an index of, of uh, water stress, uh, goes down. Uh, we have higher precipitation. Um, the number of frost-free days are generally go down at higher elevation. Um, mean temperature in the warmest month goes uh, goes down at higher elevation. Um, here's what that looks like for the transects. And so these are these are noisy, but these are the broad trends that separate these um, these populations along these replicate contrasts. Um, so in general, I'm going to refer to these as elevational uh, elevational contrasts. Um, to identify elevation-associated SNPs in these contrasting sets, um, at every SNP in the data set, I've, I've fitted a model of the presence of, an, of the reference allele in a binomial uh, generalized linear model, um, and used two models, actually. Um, in the one, we're explaining the presence of the allele with elevational position within a pair or a transect, and a random effect of the identity of the pair or the transect, so we assume there's some uh, baseline difference in allele frequency among pairs and transects. And then in model two, as a, as a null model, um, I'm fitting presence of allele as a function of just that random effect of uh, pair or transect. And then if I make a, a formal model comparison, um, I set that up in such a way that a higher uh, delta AIC value indicates that elevational position is contributing more to improve our understanding of, or our prediction of the presence of the reference allele uh, in that pair of transect, or actually not just in one pair of transect, but across all of the pairs of transects in the, in the data set. Um, and so that's a that's a straightforward a priori a priori way to do this. Um, to to compare it to what I would get otherwise, I went ahead and used the rest of the data set as a standard for comparison. So the unstructured sampling sites in the in the Adaptree data set still include 165 sites uh, that are not assigned to a pair of transect. I ran the, the Bay Pass uh, version of uh, the Bay MD test for allele frequency association with climate, and I um, did that association against 22 different temperature and rainfall and uh, geographic related variables, all from um, the sampling sites. Um, and these are compiled from the, the Climate North America database, which is, um, which is available online. Um, this provides context for the pair and transect outlier steps, and it lets us know what's actually going on. Um, so, what do the results look like? Well, first, the pairs on the transects uh, agree in what they find as outliers in those models that I fitted. Um, so, uh, this is comparing the effect estimate in population pairs versus the effect estimate in transects uh, for the same SNPs. 
Um, you can see across the whole data set, the, the correlation is positive and strongly statistically significant because we have lots of points, but it's pretty weak. Um, and it's really basically a point cloud. But if I restrict that, that comparison to SNPs that have a delta AIC of 10 or greater in either the pair or the transect data set, um, we get a much stronger correlation. So the two data sets in independent population sets and with these different sampling structures are confidently identifying outliers in the same direction. So that's, that's a, good, a good first step. Um, SNPs that are outliers on pairs or transects are also outliers in um, population structure as estimated by uh, BayPass. So uh, BayPass calculates the BAND uh, XTX statistic, which is a, an index of uh, population allele frequency differentiation. Um, you can see these are very messy uh, scatter plots. They're not at all, um, they're not at all nice, but the, the SNPs that are confidently identified as outliers are more likely to have high uh, differentiation in A and B in the other populations. So um, this is things that are elevational outliers are structured in the rest of, in a totally independent, not totally independent, a different set of, of uh, populations. If I look at the proportion of uh, SNPs that are outliers for both pairs and transects, uh, and ask which, what proportion of them show up as outliers in the Bay and B Bay pass analysis. I find lots of cases where um, a lot of the, the pair transect outlier set are outliers for association to um, things like degree days over five, the climate moisture deficit, uh, the summer heat moisture index, degree days over, under zero degrees centigrade, the temperature difference, uh, precipitation of snow, mean annual precipitation, Elevation, um, that's a, it's good to see that things that are elevational outliers are also um, elevational outliers in the, the unstructured population. And uh, mean annual temperature. Um, if I look at the, the distribution of bay pass effect sizes from, uh, from all of those individual associations and the unstructured populations, and zero in on the SNPs in those distributions that are elevational outliers, they are SNPs with larger effects, um, and that's what we might expect actually. These are SNPs that are, uh, that are differentiating even though they are experiencing a lot of gene flow from the adjacent population, either the other population of the pair or populations adjacent on the transect. Um, so we would expect that SNPs with larger effects will uh, be more resistant to that gene flow. The actual frequency changes between pairs or along transects are pretty small, and um, that's again as expected. We're looking at we're looking at close geographic proximity, um, and if I take uh, allele frequencies at the uh, at the elevational outliers and fit them in a model to climate at the unstructured sites, um, so all of this data is from the unstructured sites. We, act, we get pretty good predictive power from the elevation outliers to the unstructured sites. Um, here's for degree days below zero, mean annual precipitation, uh, and the moisture deficit. Uh, here's latitude, which is which is um, not strongly not explaining a lot of variation, but it's, it's a significant association, which is kind of cool. Um, elevation and, and latitude are capturing some of the same uh, some of the, some of the same things. Um, so in general, SNPs showing differentiation in these replicate contrasts are enriched for GEA candidates in an independent test, um, particularly things associated with temperature. Um, differentiation is driven by really just intermediate changes in frequency of the fields with larger effects, and they predict climate variation in other populations. So that's um, suggestive that these biologically informed replicate comparisons can get the job done. Um, so thanks to the uh, Adaptree collaboration, and if you like this kind of work, I'm setting up a lab. Um, come join me in LA. Uh, thanks.